Thank you and welcome uh, either for the first time or welcome back to the symposium. I'm Kevin McConkey and my role is uh, first to simply introduce the, the chair of this session, but more importantly, to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we all gather. In my case, I'm sitting currently on a Wabakal land and to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, this is a critically important session of asking the question, can Australia actually achieve meaningful reconciliation with First Nations people? It's going to be chaired by uh, Ian Anderson. Uh, Ian is a Palawa man from the northwest coast of Tasmania. He's currently Deputy Vice Chancellor for Student and University Experience at the Australian National University. Um, Ian's had a long career in government and in universities, uh, starting with his work as a uh, as a medical doctor in 1989, and he spent most of his professional life working in indigenous related health and education, and more broadly for the Australian community. So over to you, Ian, thank you. As um, most people for the last two years have learned, um, I've got to turn my mute button off. So, um, yeah, Palangina, um, Pungana Ian Anderson, Palawa Chawana, a Plamamarada Chawalawe, um, a Palabana. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in the land of the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people, but um, what behind me, uh, you can see, um, what looks like a beautiful coast. It's on the south coast. This is uh, a place called Larapana. Um, Larapana is is a uh, is where my traditional country is. Um, I, have, I, I have links to a number of parts of Australia. This is kind of what I call my born, my spiritual, uh, my spiritual home. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge in the land of, in the language of Palawakani, the animal and the Gamri people and acknowledge all the, all the different various countries that we're all on at the moment. I'm going to chair for the session uh, this afternoon. I, <clears throat> I um, experienced another one of the hitches in Zoom. I was sitting out there um, waiting for the, the magic key to arrive so I can get in. And so there's one thing I haven't checked with my colleagues about how we're going to manage time uh, today. So I think that the way in which I will do that is when I come close to uh, um, uh, the 15 uh, minutes mark, I might just um, butt in for uh, three seconds, that you know, close. And then I think at the... Uh, I'm not sure what Zoom etiquette is, uh, whether or not Zoom just got down at the 10 minute mark. So I will, um, um, just wanted to uh, remind people that we'll have a, we'll have um, four 15 minute presentations followed by about 20 minutes Q&A. Um, and that well, whilst we're, um, we're coming up to that Q&A, you might want to type in your questions into the Q&A box uh, into the event and just remind people that uh, if you need to, um, uh, just keep your uh, your video off in the interests of saving um, bandwidth. So I'm going to go straight in and introduce uh, Emeritus Professor John Maynard, who's a Waramai man from the Port uh, Stephens region of New South Wales. He's had several major positions and uh, served as Deputy Chairperson of the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies and the, uh, exec, uh, on the Executive Committee for the Australian uh, Historical Association. He's going to talk to um, 17 minutes past on the fight for liberty and freedom, understanding the lessons of history and Aboriginal perspective. Um, a very warm welcome to John, and I'd like to say hi. It's been a couple of years, John. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ian, for that kind introduction. As mentioned, uh, Warramai Man from the Port Stephens region of New South Wales, and I take the opportunity to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners right across this continent, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, can Australia achieve meaningful reconciliation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? I will be blunt. Australia cannot achieve that goal unless we adequately deal with and heal from the past. African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois in 1935 describes our present and ongoing dilemma. Nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs 
They do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all this so far as the truth is ascertainable? I want to go back nearly 100 years in search of historical truth. In late 1927, an Aboriginal man wrote an impassioned and inspiring letter to a young Aboriginal girl abused within the so-called government-operated Aboriginal apprenticeship scheme. He offered support, encouragement and comfort, advising the girl she was but one of many Aboriginal girls suffering sexual abuse and maltreatment within the scheme. He asked for details of the man responsible and promised that he would see the perpetrator in court. The man who wrote that letter was my grandfather, Fred Maynard. He was the leader of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, the AAPA, today recognised as the first united all Aboriginal political organisation to form in this country. And my grandfather is pictured behind me on the image uh, with his sister Emma at the rocks in 1927 at the height of his political activity and also his organisation's logo on across my other shoulder. In a letter sent to the AAPA's head office in Cran Street, Sydney, my grandfather learned of this girl's plight. The girl at the age of 14 had been raped by the manager of the station in Western New South Wales, where she was placed. On becoming pregnant, the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board put her on a train to Sydney, where she had the baby. The records state that the baby died at birth, but remain inconclusive of the baby's true fate. The child may have simply been removed from the young girl. The protection board immediately placed her back on the train to the original place of abuse. It was at this point that Maynard received notification and he was sheerly, clearly shaken by this girl's experience. His anger and anguish readily revealed in the text that survives in the New South Wales State Archival Record. And he said, my heart is filled with regret and disgust. First, because you were taken down by those who were supposed to be your help and guide through life. What a wicked conception, what a fallacy. Under the so-called pretense and administration of the board governmental control. I say deliberately, the whole damn little thing has got to stop and by God's help it shall. Make no mistake, no doubt they are trying to exterminate the noble and ancient race of sunny Australia. Away with the damnable insulting methods. Give us a hand and stand by your own native Aboriginal officers and fight for liberty and freedom for yourself and for your children. Why is this letter so important? Because it is a clear indication of the missing history the country does not know. I came through a school system of the 1950s and 1960s where historically we as Aboriginal people had been conveniently missed, overlooked, forgotten, or dare I say, erased from the pages of Australian history. We know this. W.H.E.H. E. Stanner, in his landmark 1968 ABC Boyer lecture, alerted the nation that the history of Aboriginal Australia was shrouded within what he called the Great Australian Silence. Henry Reynolds, in 1972, stated that we, as Aboriginal people, were the fringe dwellers of Australian historiography. There are many who prefer the comfort of history that was the staple for two thirds of the 20th century. The history taught during the 50s and 60s, Captain Cook discovered Australia, he did not. Australia was peacefully settled, it was not. Why are so many challenged by a genuine understanding of the past? Is it guilt, fear or just plain ignorance? I hope that the Minister for Education, Alan Tudge, will come to fully appreciate the move for a balanced and inclusive understanding of the past. Recently, the minister was clearly challenged by the new draft national history curriculum. He stated that he deplored attempts to present a miserable negative view of our history and was against attempts to contest historical events of national significance. My intention in writing history is not to lay blame or guilt but to deliver a genuine balanced history of the country's past, one that can inspire, inform, educate and aid the healing process from the past. Misinformation about Australia's past is the very reason why we as historians need to inform and educate Australians on the importance of understanding history. My grandfather's story as leader of the first United All Aboriginal Political Organisation, 
established in Sydney is just one of many stories that needs to be told. Many assume that organised Aboriginal political activism had its birth during the turbulent 1960s and 1970s and believe that Aboriginal demands for land rights was a product of that time. People think that the push for Aboriginal self-determination started with the Whitlam Labor government in 1972. Wider recognition of massacres, warfare, and that 1788 was an invasion of this country are believed to have surfaced during the 1970s. And that the recent move for an Indigenous voice to Parliament was first expressed through the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I want to discuss these major points, self-determination, land rights, invasion and voice. We need to go back nearly 100 years to gain an understanding of the ignition point of these issues. My grandfather, Fred Maynard, as I said, was president of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association established in Sydney in 1924. In April 1925 at St David's Church and Hall in Surrey Hills, they held the first ever Aboriginal Civil Rights Convention staged in this country. Front page Sydney newspaper coverage of the event reveals that over 200 Aboriginal people attended that conference. The newspaper banners read, Aborigines demand self-determination and self-determination is their aim. This was 50 years before the Whitlam government accredited with putting up self-determination as a desired Aboriginal policy approach. In 1927, the AAPA published widely through the press a manifesto that was also forwarded to both the state and federal governments. They made several demands, including the granting of 40 acres of land for each and every Aboriginal family in the country. My grandfather added that Aboriginal people had overriding rights above all others in this respect. This was a clear demand for a national land rights agenda. The AAPA manifesto was dismissed by the Jack Lang Labor government in New South Wales. This dismissal saw my grandfather write an inspired letter to Lang to better inform him of the history of the continent. And he said, I wish to make it perfectly clear on behalf of our people that we accept no condition of inferiority as compared with European people. Two distinct civilizations are represented by the respective races. That the European people, by the art of war, destroyed our more ancient civilization is freely admitted, and that by their vices and diseases our people have been decimated is also patent. But neither of these facts are evidence of superiority. Quite the contrary is the case. The members of the AAPA have also noted the strenuous efforts of the trade union leaders to attain the conditions which existed in our country at the time of invasion by Europeans. The men only worked when necessary. We called no man master and we had no king. This letter was written in 1927. Note the use of the words invasion and war. These concepts are not products of the 1970s. It is critically important to recognise that the AAPA manifesto also contained a demand that all state Aboriginal protection boards were to be abolished and replaced by an Aboriginal board to sit under the Commonwealth Government. This was clearly the first demand for an Aboriginal voice to Parliament. Adding further evidence to this demand, an article published in the Sydney Labor Daily on Saturday 2nd February 1929 revealed that two Aboriginal speakers would put their case forward for Aboriginal policy reform. It said that on the following Tuesday evening at the School of Arts in Chatswood, the president of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, Mr F.G. Maynard, accompanied by another Aboriginal speaker, would address the members of the Chatswood Willoughby Labor League on Aboriginal matters generally. My grandfather was described as a forceful and logical speaker who would explain some of the disadvantages under which his people labour. It was said that he was striving by voice and pen in bringing about much needed reform. It was further revealed that there was a move to establish an association of white Australians to assist with a push to have an Aboriginal repre represent his people in federal parliament or failing that, have an Aboriginal ambassador appointed to live in Canberra to watch his people's interests and advise the federal authorities. In a newspaper interview, my grandfather revealed the police threats and intimidation he was facing at the time. And he said he had been warned on many occasions that the doors of Long Bay Jail were opening for him. 
He would cheerfully go to jail for the remainder of his life, he declared, if by so doing he could make the people of Australia realise the truly frightful administration of the Aborigines Act. The AAPA disappeared from public view in 1929 through police intimidation on behalf of the government, state government's New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. It has been the very erasure of history like that of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association that still impacts on our understandings of the past today. The opportunity to understand, recognise and celebrate the long history of the Aboriginal political struggle is not a negative, but a truth that can enhance the nation today. That is why history is so important to this country. Sadly, we continue to resist learning from the past and making up for our mistakes. Australia today is not the country of the 1950s and the white Australia policy. We have witnessed since the Second World War massive Im immigration from Europe, Asia, the Middle East and Africa. And we all crave a far more just and equitable future for all Australians of all backgrounds. And that includes delivering a genuine, more balanced understanding of the past. Thank you. Um, 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 Professor Maynard, that was extraordinary, both in terms of your timing, but also, which was impeccable, uh, but also how much you reminded me of the extraordinary contribution your grandfather made to the history of this country. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for being the opening speaker. Um, I want to turn and invite Fiona uh, Felicity Meekins to join me on the Zoom screen. Uh, Felicity uh, is an ARC Future Fellow in Linguistics at the University of Queensland and is a, uh, a researcher on an ARC Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. Uh, she is a field linguist who specialises in the documentation of First Nations languages in Northern Australia, an incredibly important task at the moment across Australia, uh, and uh, particularly on the impact or effect of English on these languages. Now, I will invite Felicity to uh, start her presentation, and I'll give her a reminder at 1.32. Great. Thanks very much for um, that introduction. I'll just uh, share my slides now. Okay, um, so hi everyone. I'm um, zooming in from the unceded lands of Yagara and Turrbal people in what is now known as Brisbane. Um, pay my enormous respects to this mob, to my fellow panellists um, and Indigenous members in the audience. And I'd like to pay particular respects to the Gurindji mob who grew me up as a linguist. Uh, this picture comes from Gurindji country and is taken by a dear uh, Gurindji friend and colleague who some of you might know, Associate Professor Brenda Croft, who's at ANU. Um, Colonisation is evident in this picture as it will be uh, in my talk. So prior to colonisation, over 250 First Nations languages and many more dialects were spoken. Since colonisation, maybe 40 languages are still spoken, mostly by elderly people. Only 12 are being learnt by children. Uh, and in their place are Creole varieties, unique English dialects and fusions of traditional languages with uh, Creole and English. And First, Language communi First Nations communities sorry, have also been galvanising for the past two decades to reclaim and renew their languages. Um, and this is incredibly important because these languages are vital to the cultural um, and socioeconomic wellbeing and health of Australia. But unfortunately, funding for First Nations languages has been um, incredibly ina uh, inadequate. So Australia spends about $21 annually per capita of the Indigenous population, which if you compare this to other colonised um, countries like Can Canada and New Zealand is um, very little money. The federal government provides just $20 million annually to support languages through the Indigenous Languages and Arts Schemes. And again, you can compare this with the $200 million spent annually on 69 non-Indigenous LOAT languages. Some states also provide extra funding. So New South Wales um, has an additional 300,000, Queensland has an additional 400,000. Other states um, contrib contribute different amounts of money. But you can see um, this is uh, very little money for very many languages. 
And I guess one of the questions in contemporary Australia is, well, what kinds of languages need support? There are languages which have been spoken continuously since colonisation that continue to need support. Um, there are also new languages born from contact with English, and there are languages which are being reclaimed and renewed, and all of these languages need support. So I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. Most of Australia's original languages which still have child language learners are spoken in remote areas of northern and central Australia. Um, some languages um, in fairly patchy ways have been well supported through education programs. Um, one real standout is the uh, bilingual schools that are supported through the Walpuri Triangle, which supports um, schools in four different Walpuri communities. Um, so we go from primary school education all the way up to tertiary level courses. So, for instance, you can learn Yongwamata at Charles Darwin University, um, Pitanjara um, at the University of Adelaide. But all of these original languages are at the behest of different governments and changing policy environments. So, um, for instance, in 2008, the NT took the decision to abolish the existing bilingual schools called two-way schools. Um, and, and this really means that the vitality of these languages is really precarious. And this is because English only education has been shown to have a detrimental effect on the maintenance of Indigenous languages. So switching from bilingual education to monolingual education is um, really devastating for these languages. Amidst the devastating loss of First Nations languages, there is another lesser known story. So the main language actually now spoken in many Indigenous communities across Northern Australia is Creole. Um, and there's also a related Creole language that's spoken in the Torres Strait. So these Creoles use English vocabulary while preserving the sound system semantics and some grammatical features common to Indigenous languages. Um, and the Creole is actually derived from an English-based pigeon which developed in the early Sydney colony and was brought north um, with the pastoral industry. So in a sense, the story of Creole is the story of colonisation. Other Indigenous languages have combined with Creole or English to create new languages. Um, and these languages don't uh, get as much press um, as the first languages. So some of the better known examples are Gurindji Creole, which I've worked on for a long time, and like Walpuri. Um, many Aboriginal English varieties still show really strong connections with traditional languages through different kinds of mixing practices, which often involve the use of vocabulary, grammar, other kinds of markers of identity, um, which, you know, uh, uh, programs like Black Comedy, for instance, um, do a wonderful job, I think, of showcasing Aboriginal English. Some of funding agencies, though, like the ILA, which I've talked about, explicitly refuse to support these varieties. But for younger generations, these new languages represent the continuity of their local identity as well as their changing world. It's a creative linguistic space which sits on the interface of tradition and modernity and is essential to acknowledge if Australia is to address the alarmingly high youth suicide rates and generally low health and wellbeing indicators in First Nations communities. To give you a sense of just how quickly these varieties have come up, I want to introduce you to some of the people that I work with at um, Kalkarinji. So this is Topsy Dodd Nanjal, who um, is a senior songs woman at Kalkarinji, and we've done lots of work uh, documenting song language. Um, her daughter's there, Deborah Vincent, and then her um, little girl, uh, Vicar, is also there. So just within um, these three people within a single family, we can see um, how quickly language has changed. So Topsy's a bilingual speaker of Gurindji um, and Creole, also speaks other Indigenous languages. Her daughter, Deborah, um, speaks the new language, the mixed language Gurindji Creole, which has come out of the mixing practices that that older generation use. And her little daughter, Vikara, who's now talking age, this was taken when she was a baby, also speaks Gurindji Creole. And that language for her has fused and solidified much more. Um, so you can see how quickly these languages come about. And you can see, in fact, how this process happens even within um, single communities like Kalkarindji in the Northern Territory.
So although many First Nations languages no longer have um, first language speakers, there's been an absolutely inspiring renaissance of languages that's been happening over the last decades. Um, a lot of these programs utilise resources from archives, museums and libraries, like um, old wordless dictionaries and grammatical descriptions. And these places um, for the people who engage with them can be places of trauma, um, re-finding information, but also places of um, immense rediscovery. This resurgence of First Nations languages um, began in the 1990s with Ghana, the language of Adelaide and the Adelaide Plains. Um, you can see Jack Buckskin there, um, uh, one of the younger generation of language champions coming through teaching Ghana. Uh, since then, the revitalization movement in Australia has seen the development of many different um, education programs from language nests, um, which immer uh, immerse young children in language, uh, to tertiary level qualifications for um, adult speakers. So for instance, if we're thinking about Ghana, then um, you can learn Ghana, for instance, at the University of Adelaide. But language renewal activities aren't limited to the classroom. They're also finding their place um, in really beautiful artistic practices. So I've got this example here of Sonia and Lisa Carmichael, who are Kondamulka Mugi artists from Minjeraba, which is an island just off um, Brisbane. And they do a lot to embed their Jundai language in their weaving practices. You can see an example there and also um, Sinotype works. Um, if we zoom across the country um, to Perth, um, we have these fabulous um, uh, works within the, the performing arts industry, which Clint and Kylie Bracknell have been responsible for. So, for instance, dubbing the Bruce Lee film uh, Fist of Fury in Noongar, um, also uh, they've uh, produced a Noongar version of um, Macbeth called uh, Hecate. And all of this is done in the language of Perth and the surrounding region. And languages are also finding their place in literature. Um, if we go to New South Wales, the Wiradjuri language um, forms a really important part of Tara June Winch's Miles Franklin award-winning novel, The Yield, um, and also Anita Heiss's new novel. Nadi Simpson also uses URLRI um, in her book, Song of the Crocodile, which came out this year. So there's um, a burgeoning literature now where we're seeing First Nations words and phrases, um, often untranslated, uh, in our literature. And just finally, First Nations languages are also a really crucial part of many uh, Indigenous range of programs across Australia. So most fundamentally, Indigenous names are being repatriated to national parks. We saw um, recently, for example, in Queensland that the bachelor name Gari was recently repatriated to Fraser Island. Um, and um, in this particular example here is um, again back to Gurindji country. So the Gurindji language has formed a really integral part of the work of the Munguru Munguru rangers at Kau Gurindji. Um, and this example here is a series of plant and animal posters which have QR codes so um, you can listen to them. Um, and they use the Gurindji language to document uh, cultural knowledge of local fauna and flora. Um, and um, this is a picture of a couple of um, the rangers who I've worked with, Helma Bernard um, and Harmon Scobie, who um, have worked on these poster projects. So that was a, a whirlwind tour through the contemporary linguistic landscape of Australia. Um, and I'll conclude by putting the urgency of the situation into a worldwide context. So language diversity is actually under greater threat than biodiversity, but it's charismatic species, as the biologists call them, plants and animals that get the attention, not languages. So of the approximately 7,000 languages that are still spoken, nearly half of them are considered endangered. And all of these endangered languages are spoken by um, minority and marginalized indigenous groups. Without intervention, this language loss is going to triple in the next 40 years. And currently, Australia has the dubious honour of having one of the highest rates of language, language loss worldwide. So next year um, begins the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. This is one of the UNESCO international decades. And during this time, it 
international attention will be drawn to Australia. So I'd really like to see Australia stepping up um, and providing a lot more support for Indigenous languages. Um, th thank you, Felicity, uh, for reminding us that the pathway, one of the pathways to reconciliation um, involves us working together to recognise uh, about the extraordinary cultural asset that Indigenous Australia is, some of the loss that we've experienced over many years and recognise the work ahead, but also the extraordinary efforts that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people have made um, uh, around just language renewal, language also, and, and the broader landscape of, of, of culture. Um, Palawakani, um, being one of those languages that you were talking about as, as a result of uh, community effort over some decades to remember the, the language um, uh, of, of Tasmania or the languages of Tasmania. Uh, I describe Palawakani as the language Aboriginal women spoke so that the sealers, the white sealers, uh, actually couldn't know what they were talking about. It was a language that also remembers incredible trauma. So I want to um, thank you and then invite uh, Thomas Mayer to the to the Zoom screen. Um, so um, I think that I, I first met um, uh, Thomas um, when uh, af after I'd started working for the current government, as I was trying to find a way in which to navigate a pathway around constitutional recognition and and many of the aspirations of, of the Uluru Statement in a um, that held true to the aspirations of the Uluru Statement, and now I'm not in government and not the views of the government of the time. There, there, were, there were two things that really struck me when I um, uh, met him was but both uh, the deep passion to con constitutional reform and the passion to uh, the Uluru Statement and what that meant, but also to um, incredible political skill in being able to navigate almost anyone who would listen to him uh, from, from way across the political spectrum, from, uh, um, from his heartland in the union movement and the Maritime Union of Australia, uh, sorry, uh, which he joined um, as, as a young man in 17 and then became a member in his 30s, right, right across to um, maybe not the neocons, but very close to um, uh, very conservative people in, in the Australian government and also to the, the, the willingness to wrangle with a whole bunch of legal minds, but with a, with a, with a strong ethical framework and a strong commitment uh, to social justice. So I'd like to introduce uh, Thomas, who will talk about this, the, the Hillary Statement and the Priority of a Voice, and I'll give you a reminder at 1.47. Thank you, Ian. Really nice to see you again, mate. Um, it's been a while and uh, I just want to begin paying my respects to the Larrakia people and their elders past and present, coming to you from Darwin here um, and all of the still sovereign, never ceded um, traditional owners around the place and all the mob listening. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give, uh, I'm not used to writing a speech and reading it, but uh, um, Kevin asked me to make sure I wrote a speech for everyone to read. So this is going to be a bit different from me, so I'll do my best. Um, thank you for, for inviting me to speak. Um, this is uh, from my context on how I understand the priority of a voice um, from my life experience and, um, and why, uh, how I think we can achieve it. So I've been a member of the trade union movement since I commenced my working life at the Port of Darwin at 17 years old. And it's there on the walls through the Maritime Union of Australia that I learned the value of using the leverage of unity. I've seen individual workers uniting to make change at the workplace level. I've seen ports and state branches uniting to make change at the state level. And I've seen trade, trade unions themselves united in very specific campaigns to make major lasting national change that is to the benefit of all workers. The union movement has won many a battle for workers and social justice. We have brought our society from one where workers were mere servants, punished for disobeying the master. We have come from a place where children were forced to labour in harsh conditions and where First Nations people were slaves. 
to a society that now enjoys universal health care, weekends, various loadings, allowances and legislated rights. Each of these wins for the union movement and society and society were maligned by employers and right-wing politicians who warned of impending doom from our success. But their claims of Armageddon, should these changes happen, have been thoroughly proved as selfish fear-mongering. Workers and their communities have progressed so far because unions were organised at many levels, including at the highest political level since the establishment of the Australian Labor Party. The working class has progressed because we have built strong and unapologetically representative structures that can influence laws and policies and organise to hold employers and politicians to account. And we are always under attack because of this. I was a 20 year old Wharfie when Prime Minister John Howard colluded with Patrick Stevedores and the National Farmers Federation to silence the voice of maritime workers. In the middle of the night in April 1998, Patrick Stevedores sent balaclava clad mercenaries onto wharves around the country to physically drag us from our workplaces, locking us out of our livelihoods. It was part of the Howard government's grand plan to silence all workers by destroying their unions. Howard failed to destroy the MUA because of our long-standing structure, discipline, financial resources, and the leverage of unity that the union movement had. And after several months of battle on the streets and in the courts, we victoriously marched back on the walls to work. Where Howard failed though, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people acting as a collective, he succeeded. He attacked the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, a representative voice for First Nations people. He used its flaws as a weapon instead of dealing with its issues and building on its strengths. Since ATSIC was silenced, we have seen the Northern Territory emergency um, response or intervention. We have seen hundreds of millions of dollars misdirected away from the communities and services that are needed. And we have seen the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous citizens widen. Divided, we suffer. So I've briefly described how unions have achieved great progress for workers and society in general, because it is one of the ways I understand the significance of establishing a constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice to parliament, as called for in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It is also how I understand that at Uluru, the 250 delegates from throughout the Australian continent that shaped and endorsed the Uluru Statement made the right decision, prioritising the voice in our proposed sequence of change. Before I go on, it is worth briefly recapping on how the Uluru Statement came to be and what, it has happened, what has happened since. The Uluru Statement is an unprecedented national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consensus that came from the rare opportunity, an opportunity only achieved through relentless advocacy, to conduct a well-resourced and intensive series of dialogues culminating in a national constitutional convention at Uluru. The statement brings together the collective wisdom of over 200 years of struggle. At that final convention in the heart of the nation on 26 May 2017, we were 270 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from throughout this great continent and from many different First Nations. The difficulty, the hard work, the passion of the debate and the achievement of the third and final morning, the achievement of a national consensus, cannot be underestimated for its national significance. The endorsement of the Uluru Statement was a political feat that should be recognised and celebrated, but predictably, the Turnbull government did the opposite. The call for a constitutionally enshrined voice was officially dismissed by Prime Minister Turnbull in October of 2017, misinforming the Australian public that the proposal was for a third chamber in Parliament. But this dismissal has been turned around by the weight of numbers by a majority of Australians who say that if they were to have the opportunity to answer the invitation to walk with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a referendum for a voice, they would say yes. To turn the dismissal around, a mountain of work has been done by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advocates and our allies. A turnaround that is even more remarkable because we have had few resources with which to campaign with. There's been no government support to educate people about the Uluru Statement and the reasons we gave for its proposals, nothing from which to even build a campaign organisation. We were starting from scratch. The Uluru Statement itself, the sacred canvas, 1.6 by 1.8 metres, imbued with Anugu Tukaba, and the 250 names of representatives proved to be our most powerful campaign tool. 
The MUA, at the request of Arnie Pat Anderson, who led the dialogues process to Uluru, second, seconded me to take the canvas around the country to inspire a people's movement. For 18 months, I hit the road and everywhere the Uluru statement went, support multiplied. Another key moment was when Wiradjuri and Wild One lawyer Teela Reid challenged Malcolm Turnbull on national television, exposing his ignorance and lies. In the Prime Minister's electorate of Wentworth, the grandchildren of the great Gurindji leader, Vincent Lingyari, engaged with voters to explain the bungling of the great opportunity the Uluru Statement provides, the opportunity to right the wrongs of the past in a way that the people who were wrong themselves had chosen. And at the Gama Festival, the late John Christopherson, an elder from Kakadu in Arnhem Land, spoke of the hope that the Uluru Statement gives this country, how there is nothing to lose and 100,000 years of continuous culture to gain by enshrining the voices of First Nations people in the Constitution. A grassroots movement increasingly made it loud and clear that we were not going to take no for an answer to the Uluru Statement. In 2018, moved by this growing movement of people who had learnt about the Uluru Statement's call for a voice, the government established the Bipartisan Joint Select Committee into the constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Inevitably, the committee's final report recommended that the voice is the most desired reform and that a co-design process begin. This year, the co-design groups appointed by the Morrison government have consulted with the public over 2,500 of the submissions that were published from individuals and organisations and from all different backgrounds and from across the political spectrum called for a voice for the voice question to go to a referendum. The voice co-design report, final report is with government and it will be released very soon. Surely, any fair-minded person would think the report will recommend a referendum in the next term of government. Polling since 2017 has indicated continuous growth in the numbers of Australians who will support, support a voice referendum. The latest polling by CT Group from August indicates that almost 60% of voters would support a constitutionally enshrined Indigenous voice to parliament in a referendum. Polling done specifically on Indigenous people has also shown a growth in support. Support is now at 80%. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will say they vote yes. What compels them is that the voice is a unifying reform. Which brings me to the conclusion. The campaign for a constitutionally enshrined voice is the most important campaign in our lifetimes. Because whether we are advocating for the revitalising and preserving of First Nations languages or truth telling about this nation's history, whether we are trying to strengthen our land rights, reform the justice system, or simply have more homes built in our remote communities, it all depends on our ability to build leverage and use it in a way that moves the nation's ultimate decision makers in Canberra and then hold them to account if they fail or ignore us. A constitutionally protected voice precedes truth-telling in our priorities, firstly because truth-telling is happening, great work is being done on truth-telling, including in this symposium, but most importantly, because truth-telling needs a voice. What is the truth of the past without the political power to use it for our future? A constitutionally protected voice precedes treaty, not exclusively, because treaty talks are already happening in the States. A voice must be established with urgency to support treaty making where First Nations have chosen to do so, because in a federal system, it is a commonwealth we must reckon with, with the power of the constitution behind us more importantly than the states. Finally, I reiterate these words, a constitutionally protected voice. We must, we must constitutionally protect the voice because governments like Howard's will always come along. As a union member, I know when a collective of grassroots people make those in power uncomfortable, they will move to silence them. ATSIC was one of many voices we have built to defy our government's mistreatment and cruelty to bring our voices together in a chorus that cannot be ignored. Brother John Maynard is the grandson of Fred Maynard, as he talked about, a fellow Wharfie um, his grandfather was and one of the greatest leaders our people have walked in the footsteps of. He led the Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association in the 1920s, one of the collective voices that have been silenced and as John spoke of, um, was calling for a voice to parliament so long ago. It is time to unite and build a structure of unity for First Nations that can never be silenced again. I believe we can win a referendum to protect and empower our voice. I believe we got it right in the Uluru Statement. I believe that you, all you people that are listening and everyone you know, 
would accept the invitation to walk with us. So join the campaign. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm, 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 I'm deeply impressed by the absolute skill of everyone just finishing 18 seconds ahead of the next uh, invitation. So th thank you, Thomas. And you do Thanks. remind me of many of some very difficult moments for me working in the government at that time uh, and, and watching that whole uh, argument evolve. So um, one of the, I'm going to introduce our last speaker, Biami Williamson. You're a Laley man from Northwest New South Wales and Southwest Queensland with family ties to the Northwest. Um, I, one of our emerging, emerging, sorry, not emerging, already intellectual leaders um, who's made a significant contribution, both through his academic experience in Indigenous land and water management, also Indigenous youth and Indigenous governance and Indigenous data sovereignty. So like many Indigenous academics have a very broad field of interest, which in my experience always speaks to the broad passion that people bring to uh, their academic day job, including a deep love for kids, as you can see. So um, I, I'm going to just finish and stop. Bambi uh, Army is going to talk about climate change as a transformative opportunity for reconciliation. I'm just going to remind him that I'm going to pull up around uh, two minutes after two so we can then enjoy some open conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. And I will um, endeavour to not break the, um, the mould and go over, um, uh, you know, dip my toe over a 203. So I'll pull up a 202, I promise. Um, yeah, I'm everyone, by me Williamson. Um, and this is my daughter. She's three months old in one week. This is Baralga Williamson. And we've named her after our Brolga dreaming. It's actually the Indigenous root word for the name Brolga. And um, she was born a little while ago on Gumroy country over in Moree. Um, just acknowledging that I'm joining from Tabagar country out in um, Dubbo. And uh, yeah, I just sort of like to say, it's an absolute pleasure uh, and honor even to be able to anchor this extraordinary, this extraordinary panel. Um, yeah, in particular, uh, acknowledging uh, Uncle, you know, Uncle John, who's um, good friends with my father, um, Gilla, um, and who I see very much as trailblazers. He spoke about his grandfather being a trailblazer for us, you know, to grow up under the tutelage and, and kinship of, of trailblazers such as yourself. Um, and Brother Thomas, I could have seen he, he couldn't resist a bit of product placement with dear son behind him. So I ordered that as soon as it became available. It was a present, actually, um, from my wife at Father's Day. And just want to say personally, brother, thank you very much for that book. And uh, it's much needed in telling the story of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and fathers is something that I'm really passionate about, indeed, during my PhD on. So, yeah, um, so my people come from northwest New South Wales and southwest Queensland. We kind of um, under one armpit of New South Wales and the other armpit of Queensland in, in, a, in, a, in an awkward little spot halfway along. Um, and also acknowledge my mother who comes from Concurry and her family that go up into the Gulf country, up into Normanton, up in the Gulf of Carpentaria on the Queensland side. So I'm talking, I'm going to do my best to follow what I have been, um, yeah, some extraordinary contributions already, talking about climate change as a transformative opportunity for reconciliation. So I'm an Indigenous geographer and I'm really interested in how uh, place, people, uh, culture, history and politics kind of come together in the experiences of our communities and the, and the management and care of our countries. Uh, and obviously something that continues to come up is climate change, climate justice. And you know this, this talk has been framed to really look for those opportunities and, um, and to really capitalise on the door that's really opening up for us, that is, that it, that is climate change. So for Indigenous peoples, um, it is my opinion that uh, climate change is a strategic opportunity. Settler colonial systems, processes and institutions that have invariably led to the dispossession of Indigenous peoples from our lands and waters and continue to, pe to perpetuate our marginalisation and discrimination are, uh, are being fundamentally recast in the face of climate change. The urgent need to transition the economies of the world, um, economies built on resource extraction, production and consumption, are undergoing rapid and irreversible change. 
The question therein is, will the adaptation of global political and economic systems to address anthropogenic climate change also be used as an opportunity to address historical injustices so that we seek both a sustainable and just future for all people? Or will the same systems that have produced um, uh, climate change shape shift to, to use an indigenous allegory, uh, to reproduce institutions of, in of inequality and patterns of exclusion. Both of those paths now lay before us. The catastrophic bushfires of 2019-20, uh, an event etched uh, into the collective memory of all of our people and, and, and all Australians, no doubt, really epitomised what many had feared, that uh, climate change is a present day reality. A consequence of the bushfires has been the unparalleled interest in Indigenous peoples' cultural land management practices, and in particular, cultural burning. Previously a practice in academic field largely associated with Northern and Central Australia, uh, due mostly to the legal recognition and return of lands um, uh, to Indigenous groups. Cultural burning is a practice uh, and academic field of inquiry continues to expand into Southern temperate Australia. This work has two central tenets, beginning with the benefits associated with cultural burning. Uh, these include things like the propagation of native seed banks, a reduction in invasive weeds and feral animals, safeguarding landscapes due to the reductions in forest litter and debris, connecting people and in particular children with their country and their culture, which all together fosters resilient communities and resilient landscapes. The second tenet has been the development of partnerships between Indigenous groups and external non-Indigenous agencies and organisations and communities, um, including research institutions and communities. These partnerships are critical to, to develop more effective and localised land and resource management programs and build relationships, but they offer so much more. In an era of climate change, yeah. genuine and respectful collaborations offer moments of transformation where non-Indigenous people and institutions are invited um, are invited to view the situation with a wide angle lens, examining the challenges in the context of their historical creation and being made to see the invisible barriers curtailing adaptive practices. Exploring a cultural burning, exploring um, a cultural burning program in the ACT, uh, one of my dear friends and colleagues, Dean Freeman, um, who led a, the development of a, of a research paper, um, highlighted the underlying factors that created the conditions for success for that particular program. Um, Freeman and co-authors, of which I am one, um, identify respect and justice as the foundations that, success, that the success of the program is built upon. In that way, it's clear, um, sorry, quoting from the paper, it is clear to us that the fire management unit understands that cultural burning program as part of a justice agenda for the government to show greater respects to Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and is not simply another hazard reduction exercise. Uh, another colleague of mine, Tim Neal, a non-Indigenous man who worked with the Jar Jar Wurrung community um, uh, nation in central Victoria, published a paper called Working Together, um, where they explored the, the I guess, the, um, the collaboration between Jar Jar Wurrung people and the government agencies to, to re-establish cultural burning. They observe in their paper, and I quote, the collaboration is materially and structurally redist uh, redistributing greater control over the country into the lands of Aboriginal traditional owners. What is occurring is not decolonisation in the sense of a complete and irre irreversible transfer of authority or withdrawal of settler colonial government, but rather the iterative decolonising renovation of the political and practical dominance of settler agencies. Um, another colleague, Melissa Nursey Bray, published a wonderful paper in 2020 where she and other authors reflected um, on their study of climate adaptation by the Arabana people in South Australia. They consider how deep engagement with the knowledges of the Arabana people fundamentally recast their project and what they aim to do. And I quote, the journey we took led us not to a conventional documentation of risks and perceptions about climate change couched in Western scientific traditions and terminologies, but resulted in an almost immediate reorientation of our ways of seeing and doing based on reflexive and continual feedback from our Arabana colleagues. These three examples demonstrate the depth of opportunity. Engaging with Indigenous peoples through initiatives such as cultural burning programs um, and other climate change adaptation programs provides a transformative opportunity to both develop more innovative, robust and effective land management practices, as well as the opportunity to really see the world differently, seeing the world through an Indigenous lens prospectively frames or reframes the challenges presented by anthropogenic climate change.
Casting an Indigenous lens over many established Western institutional conventions really problematizes and fundamentally recasts the approach. For instance, priorities for emergency management agencies responding to disaster are, in order of importance, life, property, environment. Yet from an Indigenous perspective, life and property exist within the environment, and so management of the environment is paramount. Additionally, transformative opportunities exist when engaging with the notion of natural landscapes. Uh, another colleague of mine, a Wiradjuri uh, Associate Professor at the University of Melbourne, Michael Sean Fletcher, wrote an extraordinary paper um, released earlier this year where he carefully uh, constructed, carefully uh, interrogated and deconstructed the perception or the idea of wilderness and engaged with this from an Indigenous perspective, revealing the Western invention of this idea of wilderness. Fletcher points out that all landscapes where human co uh, cohabit are cultural constructions with the notion of wilderness invented by Western academics and policymakers to justify the legal construction and management of um, uh, management convention of protected areas. Ironically, the myth of wilderness remains a key tool in the continued dispossession of Indigenous peoples from their lands and waters. Though these ideas may be new or considered uh, emerging in Western literature, Indigenous peoples have been advocating and, ag and agitating for these approaches and their inclusion in mainstream policies and programs for generations. One notable example is the creation of the Budge Bim cultural landscape in Western Victoria, where following formal recognition for the Guntijmara people as the traditional owners over the area formerly known as Mount Eccles National Park, the Guntijmara people took steps to reclaim their country, both physically as well as culturally and conceptually. Guntijmara people, through a settlement agreement with the Victorian state government, successfully negotiated the return of their country as well as the renaming of Mount Eccles National Park to the Budge Bim cultural landscape. They also led development of an application to the World Heritage Committee to have their region, and in particular the ancient system of eel traps developed by their ancestors, recognised as a World Heritage Site. This bid was successful. Um, excuse me, sorry. Um, this bid was successful and in 2019, Budge, the Budge Bim cultural landscape, including the eel traps, were listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, being recognised for its outstanding cultural values. I suggest that whilst the Budge Bim cultural landscape is unique, for Indigenous people, peoples, the idea is not. I ask that people consider what would a national park or system of protected areas look like from an Indigenous perspective? How might it be conceptually different? And in what ways would its management be unique and distinctive? Whilst these are interesting intellectual questions, they are necessary political conversations. The thinking and practices that have produced anthropogenic climate change are insufficient and inadequate to addressing it. To realise, or at the very least try to do things differently in the face of increasing and more severe climate change driven disasters, we must consider the ways in which the preconditions for adaptation are enabled or constrained. To return to the example of wilderness, we must be willing to reconsider the notion of protected areas and national parks, moving instead to a more pluralistic and pragmatic understanding of cultural landscapes. This requires a willingness to both think differently and do differently. But canvassing the range of policies and legislation throughout Australia reveals that even if we were willing to think and do differently, we are held back by a legal landscape anchored in colonial fantasies of wilderness. For example, in New South Wales, our most populous state and the state hardest hit by the 2019-20 bushfires, the overarching legislation that continues to dictate the protection and management of protected areas is the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Act, which, they, which was passed in 1974. How is it that we can foster adaptive practices when we're constrained by a regulatory environment some 47 years old, devised at a time when climate change was almost unheard of, and barely seven years after Indigenous peoples were recognised as possessing citizenship rights, following obviously the 1967 referendum, um, let alone any consideration of the unique rights of Indigenous peoples, such as native title or land rights. It's clear that the regulatory environment in Australia more generally, but in particular somewhere like New South Wales, needs to be thoroughly re-examined. This process must be guided by a central question of whether the regulatory environment is facilitating our adaptation or constraining it, and facilitating Aboriginal people's self-determination or constraining it. Engaging with 
Indigenous peoples must be, move beyond the add-ons or enhancements where Indigenous peoples' knowledge systems and practices are relegated to the past or only partially compatible of being integrated into an already established and immovable Western way of life. For instance, despite the gradual increase in cultural learning programs, particularly in Southern temperate Australia, it remains viewed as an additional activity, hyper-local in scale, and something of kind of a feel-good project that offers photogenic opportunities for local agencies. It is a practice that continues to be arrested at the point where it can contribute most. It, that is the widespread redefining of the notion of a healthy landscape and the role of fire in creating it. Approaches to cultural burning currently continue to fail in grasping the larger import and thus reinforces pejorative colonial stereotypes. What is missed in these moments is the opportunity to harness Indigenous knowledges to frame the problem itself. This unlearning of established Western modalities and relearning of pluralistic culturally informed methods and approaches can only genuinely occur when the self-empowerment Indigenous peoples al already possess is matched with due respect, understanding and a commitment to Indigenous peoples' self-determination from non-Indigenous peoples and institutions. In this way, adaptation is being facilitated and resilience built through a process of the renegotiation of power relations. Climate change is both an existential threat to humanity, as well as quite frankly, humanity's much need to kick up the ass. It offers a moment to stop, think, question, and make choices about our ways of life. It requires changes in attitudes and values, as well as institutions, and it requires these urgently. The tangible vision we need to respond to climate change must be stitched together with a vision for a more just and equitable nation. In this way, the ancient wisdom possessed by Indigenous peoples, wisdom which includes knowledges and memories of climate change and successful adaptation on this continent, can form a central part of Australia's response to climate change and the unrealised vision of a genuine reconciliation may also finally be attainable. Thank you. 202, Ian. Perfect. <laughs> I, I almost didn't have time to collect my thoughts. So um, um, now we have all our panellists on screen, I think. I wanted to just um, use my chair's prerog prerogative to thank everyone now. I can see someone already clapping. Um, but also just to draw out some of the connectivity between the different um, presentations. Um, my, my first thought is um, how perfectly the first and the last, last presentation actually spoke to each other uh, with John reminding us from a, from a point of view of a historian that the historical legacy that um, yields, shapes, current reconciliation agenda and attempts to manage change to the army is really elegant kind of uh, masterpiece that really mapped out the current Indigenous vision going forward. Uh, I just love the way in which you so seamlessly managed to capture all the current thought letters uh, around uh, land and land management and, and climate change, uh, including some very, very impressive um, Indigenous academics um, who are now doing their thing within their own disciplines, but actually speaking to those values and truths that raise them up. And it's a really nice way to remind us that um, the, the giants of the past uh, in some ways really shaped current uh, Indigenous intellectual work um, to, um, uh, to the kind of connectivity, um, Thomas, that you were reminded of, of the, the, the kind of the role of the, and this is what, not the purpose of your speech, but really the role of unionism um, for, uh, uh, in shaping up that history. And it kind of reminds me so much of I was actually thinking, I think uh, Kampana um, made a comment, and I'm going to go straight to that comment, about uh, the role of union history in the story of the struggle. It reminded me of um, when I was very, very young, Ani Marge Tucker talking to me one day, and, and, you know, how elders often speak to you and kind of lecture you gently, or not so gently. Um, but she was, she was reflecting, uh, and uh, Annie Marge was one of those extraordinary uh, interracial movement who was involved in Fikatsi, that first referendum struggle um, back in 1967, a yodi yodi woman. Uh, oh, back in the day, I think that's almost the words she would have used. Back in the day, back in your day, you know, 
we worked with whoever would listen to us. They'd be a church leader, they'd come from a trade union, or Ian, they might even be a member of the Communist Party. And it kind of reminded me of that real innovation in Indigenous movement um, uh, where people were came, come together outside the box, yeah? outside trade unionism, outside the church, the mainstream church, to really find, find a way to address something that was so obviously wrong. And, and again, um, uh, Felicity, that kind of reminded that that <clears throat> there is some really significant. I'm sorry, this is my reflection. There is, it's, you know, such significant p- potential by bringing together the disciplines like linguistics and anthropology uh, to find a path forward uh, for uh, positive change and how we can all uh, contribute. So I want to go to Kalpana's question and just reminded that. If you've got a question, uh, the Q&A is open. And I might actually go to her question. Uh, so good to hear about the union history made part of the story of the struggle and ask both Thomas and Fred to reflect on that. And I, I'm going to do a fangirl here. I think I'm going to say, Calvin, I think you're the anthropologist that wrote that amazing book that I that when I had five minutes where I was becoming an anthropologist in my professional career, and um, if, if I got the name right, it was about women's agency uh, in, in the south of India. And it kind of rethought, made me rethink the whole thing about how you can write, uh, how you can write ethnography, traditional disciplines in a way that's actually truly liberating. So uh, having said my Van Gel thing, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, do you want to comment? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, oh, no, I probably I'll, just... <laughs> I should have no, shut up. Thomas. So important, you know. I mean, uh, this country would be a different, di- very different place if it wasn't for the, the power that workers have built. Um, you know, for the things that I listed, um, all those outcomes. But, you know, um, and I've had a yarn with John about this as well. You know, I mean, it's, it's such an important part of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, struggle unions aren't perfect don't get me wrong I'm not saying that and we certainly haven't been throughout history you know we were behind a white Australia policy um, you know at the becoming of the federation um, but uh, but earlier than a lot of organizations and peoples you know um, workers and unions started to to call for change and um, uh, but um, and then you know from the way I, I what I talked about was just understanding that um, the power of collectivism and sticking together and um, that being a principle that um, that should, uh, you know, that, that we need to work towards as a people. We're, um, you know, uh, Felicity, Professor Felicity talked about the, the many different languages and, and, uh, and is very aware of our different cultures um, from, you know, place to place in this country. And uh, I think of it as, as unions, actually, like we... A wharfie speaks a different language to a public service worker, to a, you know, um, tertiary education worker. We all speak different languages and have different cultures, um, but we're able to come together and, and find what's in common, leave aside the things that we don't have in common, that we don't agree on, and then go forward and, and achieve change. And I think um, that's something that we can do as First Nations as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Fred, so I mean, uh, and Thomas was reminded that these were the days of the White Australia policy, in which the union movement had some impact on in shaving. So, what what do you think? Um, um, I was going to call you Fred. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's John. Like it's my grandmother, John. I just need to run through the list of kids. What do, what do you think made some some unions or some individuals stand out historically? I think this is an important question. I mean, the reality is we know we're a heavily marginalised minority in this country, but what also needs to be recognised historically, that there were people courageous um, enough to stand up and support us historically. And certainly in my grandfather's day, there was a missionary woman, Elizabeth Mackenzie Hatton, and a newspaper editor, um, JJ Maloney. And these people need to be recognised because when they were standing up and joining with our people, they were demonstrating incredible courage because they were 
a minority in those days. And we know that's continued. I mean, you look at Charlie Perkins and the Freedom Ride. There's a whole bunch of non-Indigenous students on that bus across New South Wales who copped a, you know, a pizzling for being there with him and confronting those towns with segregation and the racism that was a part of New South Wales and, and can be said still is. Um, so these people need to be recognised. The Gurindji walk off at Wave Hill, again, the demonstration of the trade union movement and the newspapers at that particular point. Um, the 67 referendum and the 10 embassy, we know, you know there's a whole bunch of non-Indigenous students that uh, were prepared to be there and support us. So this sort of stuff needs to be recognised and we, we need to mobilise that support. And certainly through the 70s and the 80s, we had, we'd won that middle ground, but that's been eroded. We need to encourage people again to be able to stand up, march and raise their voice with us. And that's exactly what Thomas is advocating. And we're reaching out to those people to genuinely make change in this country for the better of all people. So I think it's a really important question and uh, we do need support. So uh, uh, march on people and raise your voice. Um, uh, and probably, John, we have actually still won the middle ground, which is that we've got certain politicians <laughs> who require us to demonstrate 99.9% .9 support um, in order to move, for them to politically move. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, we've got a question from Tim, and it's just asking uh, for your sense of the Indigenous Protected Areas Program. Yeah, thank you. I hope I'm sorry, my thing just jumped out, jumped back in. Um, yeah, the Indigenous protected areas. Um, so thanks for the question, Tim. Great to have you in the audience. Um, I've, I've got a couple of your, your books at home and, and, and love reading all of your work. So it's wonderful, wonderful to, to be in dialogue here. Um, yeah, look, Indigenous protected areas, I think they've been one of the um, most resoundingly successful and innovative government um, programs uh, that have been developed, I guess, you know, let's say, you know, in the last 20, even 30 years. Um, they're a wonderful way um, to really acknowledge the work of communities and to bring to communities there and, and, and put them in the decision-making role, uh, I guess, a decision-making um, seat over their own country. Um, but I think the IPA program is... Um, underpinned by two critical success factors. The first one is that they're established over Indigenous lands and so Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islander people um, can, in fact, make decisions over their own lands. They're in that, they're, they're in that position. They can do that. Um, and secondly, is that the planning process and the agreement making, um, which is fundamental in the IPA process, is resourced. Communities are resourced to come together and people are resourced to work with them and do nothing but work with them to, you know, to, to work with them, to bring their communities together, to talk to um, community leaders, to get out onto the country and have a look and to really create these amazing uh, IPA plans, which are, which are wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful plans and kind of a testament to the hard work of, of decades of community fighting for their country and also the wonderful, non, often non-Indigenous people um, that work alongside them to create these um, these incredible programs. I will say it's limited, in my opinion anyway, by three, three really interrelated but critical factors. The first one is it doesn't nearly provide enough resources for communities to be able to manage the land in the ways that they want and get the outcomes that they so desire. It's kind of like they're expected, you know, the IPA program, there's a bit of money to it, but really compared to the national budget, it's like they're expected to manage these vast sorts of land to, to recuperate, you know, criminally degraded landscapes um, you know, running off the fumes of a national budget. Like, it's just not much there. And, and it's completely and wholly insufficient to create really, you know, the, 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 desired, the desired impact. And, um, and you know, the, the Australian government loves to, um, to use it to report on their, uh, on their climate change adaptation and, and responsibilities under the Convention for Wildlife Management, why not um, internationally? So the first one is that it's really, really, you know, woefully under-resourced. The second one... The second limitation is, well, it's not really, a, a, it's a limitation in some respects, but the fact is IPAs only really exist over Indigenous lands or lands with really strong um, native title provisions. And so what you do then is you really disenfranchise more than half of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, uh, more than half of, especially Aboriginal people living in southern parts of Australia from their own country and having these wonderful, they're having access to these wonderful programs. 
But I would personally really love to see the IPA program, one, legislated to create some protection because currently it's not, it's just a program, and two, expanded to include national parks and protected areas so that national parks and protected areas, like a traditional owner group, can enter into an agreement-making process about a, and, and establish an IPA over national parks and protected areas in their traditional country. Um, and the third one is that the third limitation is that it rarely, if ever, does it provide any extra legal enforceabilities for traditional owners. So they create these wonderful management plans and they're all about recuperating the country, um, mitigating against uh, really large uh, uh, bushfires in particular. Um, but it's just all too common. If you go out and talk to any Aboriginal group who's got an, or Torres Strait Islander group who's got an IPA, there's people on their hunting, there's people on their fishing, there's people on their destroying sacred sites, there's people on their four wheel driving. There's a lot of incursions by non Indigenous peoples and people who just don't you know, care into their country and I guess because it's where, where it's Aboriginal owned land say in the Northern Territory um, land returned through the land rights they do have kind of you know they, they can to a certain degree kind of move them on but really there's no there's no legal enforceable penalties around that and, and the and the groups who the rangers who um you know who, who enforce that stuff can't you know certainly can't prosecute people who come on and, and, and act against the wishes of the traditional owned community so I'd say it's it's a wonderful program, but again, it's just kind of like an um, you know it's a it's a shadow of the program that it really could be. Okay, thank you. So, so Tim, I'm going to go to Karen Fisher because, and then come back to your question. And Karen asks um, um, Felicity about uh, how we might build to uh, build uh, momentum to rename place names so that. First Nations languages become a daily sound to more people. And I, I saw that um, a comment and I, I really reminded me of a piece that Tony Birch, who's an Aboriginal writer once, wrote um, back in the olden days, as I'd say to my daughter, um, uh, and really kind of reflecting on, on the, the struggle in the 1990s. And it was, it was almost a revolutionary struggle to rename brackets just to, to suggest that the name of the Grampians was also Garrawood. Um, and I, I, I remember asking, you see, Tony went out and interviewed a whole bunch of farmers, other people from, uh, the, from the area. And I asked him, I said, that's extraordinary that they, those folks actually told you what they thought and said, well, Ian, you know, there is some advantage sometimes in being slightly fairer skinned. Um, they were kind of taking, talking to me like I might have been one of the cousins on, on their side of the family rather, and it just came out. Um, so um, it, it, it hasn't got easier in the 30, 40 years since then, uh, Karen? Uh, Felicity, sorry, it was Karen that was asking the question. <laughs> Other, other thing about Zoom is always check the name. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a couple of ways that place names, um, where place names are being repatriated have happened. Sometimes it's done in a grassroots way. So that example that I gave of um, the name Gari uh, being returned to Fraser Island, that, that was actually something that Butchler Mob have been um, doing over the years and putting that name out there. And so there's been, you know, many of us in Queensland who've shifted to using the Butchler name and, and now that's just been officially acknowledged by the Queensland Government through um, the Department of... Um, oh, I've forgotten which the department is, but uh, it's the department that holds um, national parks under it. So, so I think there's grassroots ways where this has happened. This has been happening with Minjeriba, North Stradbroke Island um, as well in Queensland. Um, and, you know, the other, the other way of doing that is um, just a top-down approach. So um, currently National Parks um, branch in Queensland is just one by one um, starting to rename national parks. And, of course, National parks are, are slightly, they're artificial, they're, they're Western construction. So it's not as simple as, the, the islands are a much easier um, place to rename. Um, so there's different kinds of processes that happen where, uh, for instance, significant um, places on that country that have a language name sometimes become then the name for the whole national park. 
Uh, but anyway, that's an exam examples of how this sort of stuff happens. One uh, that I was involved in in the Northern Territory was the renaming of Gregory National Park to Jutwara. And um, that was a significant hill um, in the middle of the National Park that's sort of extremely sacred that then got used to rename the whole of the National Park, which is owned by um, and is in the custodianship of quite a few different um, language groups. So it's not as simple as just renaming um, a block of land, but yeah, there's different different ways that this has happened. I agree, and indeed, if it hadn't happened, um, Thomas would have been an advocate for the Ayers Rock statement. So, um, um, Biami, uh, as a geographer, do you have any reflections on name, place, and, and uh, you'd have a lot, I'm sure. So, I'm just opening up in a very light and formal way. Is there anything you might want to add? Yeah, so the naming of place, place names. So we think of kind of, um, I, I, like, I, I love it. I'm all for it um, as a first step in the first, like, in an instance. So um, I love the renaming because, it, you know, space is not something that you occupy. It is something that you occupy physically, but it's also a place that you occupy mentally. Um, and so the renaming, the, the renaming of, of, of landscapes, um, one, it connects, well, it, it's, not, it's not even the renaming, it's the reclamation of its actual name in the first instance. It's like the, the English version was not its first name. Um, the English version was just like this awkward little period of 15 minutes in the whole history of the country when someone else came and decided to call it something else. But it really, it really creates space um, for engagement and, and forced engagement um, where, where non-Indigenous peoples are compelled to engage with the fact that, there's ab that it is Aboriginal land, you know, um, and I think it really speaks to the cultural significance and the spirituality of the landscape and the people in the, the landscape as well. Um, and I love that it does, it, it kind of, you know, we need to, it kind of gets in people's faces and gets in people's faces again that, you know, you don't go to Fraser Island and go to Kari now. Um, and, yeah, I think it's great. It would be great if the renaming actually meant re-regulation as well. And that's the missing piece. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back Felicity, to another question for you from Tim Rouse. Um, uh, and he, he's going to constitutional recognition of Indigenous languages as proposed by the expert panel in 2012. That's the, I believe, the UNESCO panel, yeah, on, on languages, um, but not carried forward in... So actually, I don't quite understand uh, how Tim has written the, the question, but... Just so let's go to constitutional recognition of Indigenous languages. Do you think that it may have or could contribute to uh, survival? Uh, yeah, so Thomas might have a bit more to say about the actual um, sort of machinations of it in terms of the Uluru Statement, but I'll just say um, also that, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think this is um, uh, a really key point, what happens when you change the constitution, you change those broader principles as there's trickle down effects into policy. So for instance, at the moment, um, uh, if you look at somewhere like the Northern Territory, the, the language and cultures program there is, there's a fabulous curriculum that was developed uh, about 15 years ago, I think, really, really fantastic, only part of the curriculum that, that's not compulsory. Therefore, it doesn't need to be funded and therefore it's up to individual school principals to decide whether they want to redirect, um, you know, discretionary funding within the schools. If you have something like um, constitutional reform where um, uh, uh, First Nations languages are actually um, embedded in that and recognised in that, hopefully that then, like I said, has a, has a trickle down effect where um, there is obligatory, that these languages are obligatorily funded through, uh, for instance, school programs, but also um, many other areas. But maybe Thomas should speak more about um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And before I do, I just have to say, Thomas, I'm loving seeing your Freedom Day book. You and I both have um, uh, Rosie's Smiler in common as a, a colleague and a friend. So nice to see you there. Yeah, uh, thanks. Mother let Thomas knows that we're about to get wrapped. Yeah, I'll be really brief. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Felicity and uh, absolutely, you know, I mean, you enshrine a, uh, a First Nations voice representative body uh, in our constitution that brings with it, you know, our, our voice and our languages. And, and you know, I, what Brother um, Biami was talking about and, and everyone, it relates to everything, right? You know, you, you bring... Um, the voice of our environment, you know, of our country and, and our custodianship of that. 
into into the rule book and, and forces this this nation to reckon with that, you know, and, and those politicians and and for us to be able to hold them to account for all those things. So I think it does. I realised the question earlier briefly. I, I did not um, answer properly. The question was, how do you get involved? www.fromtheheart.com.au is a campaign website. There's campaign tools on there to, to get involved and help out. Thanks. Um, so, colleagues, um, friends, um, uh, thank you for this afternoon. I think this really is the end of, I've lost my run sheet to find the final time. So at some point this will um, will be zoomed out. I uh, just wanted to thank all the contributors uh, to to this session, um, how much I loved catching up and enjoyed the conversation. And I uh, just want to say one thing, Wellika, which is roughly translated and badly translated as 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 thank you in Palawakani. Um, and um, to everyone on the panel, everyone in the Zoom room, go well. And and we we are we look forward to seeing you in the, around the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs>